Question 11 from paper 1 of the 2023 SQA Higher Physics exam. A neutron consists of one up quark and two down quarks. A neutron is, and you're given your five possibilities. Let's take a closer look at what a neutron looks like. It is there, it's got a down, a down and an up. It's made up of three quarks. And three quarks, of course, make up what we call a baryon. A baryon is a subatomic particle which is made up of three quarks. So our answer for question 11 is going to be C. A gluon, just for the sake of argument's sake, a gluon is the force mediating particle for the strong nuclear force. A meson, that's a particle made up of a quark and an antiquark. A lepton, that's the family which contains the electron and the neutrinos and that type of family. And a boson, well that's once again the mediating particle for the forces. The boson being the mediating particle. So question 11, our answer is C, it's a baryon but a neutron has three quarks and that means it's a member of the baryon family. Question 12 from the 2023 SQA Higher Physics Examination Paper 1. The following statement represents a nuclear fusion reaction. You have got 3H1 uh, plus 2H1 and that goes in to give you helium 4 He2 plus a neutron. But the thing is, if we take all the masses on the left hand side, that comes to 8.347 times 10 to minus 27 kilograms. And we compare that with the masses after the reaction on the right hand side, we can see that there's been a reduction in mass. That's what we call a mass defect. And all that really means is that the mass, according to Einstein's uh, principle is that the mass has been changed into energy in the reaction and we can find first of all that mass defect the missing mass if you can call it that way by doing that little sum there the mass before 8.347 times 10 to minus 27 and just subtract the mass afterwards 8.317 times 10 to minus 27 kilograms and you're left with 0 0.030 times 10 to minus 27 kilograms. So how can we change that into energy? Well, we use Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared, and we put in m, will stand for the mass defect, and c will be the speed of light squared. Remember, that's the conversion factor for mass into energy. If you have got some mass that's converted into energy, as in this case, you have to multiply it by c squared to get the original energy. Uh, number or the energy value and it works out to be 2.7 times 10 to the minus 12 joules and therefore our answer for that according to the sheet will be 2 times 7 to 10 minus 12 joules will be d so 12 d Question 13 from the 2023 Physics Higher Paper 1 A student makes the following statements about wave particle duality Statement 1, the photoelectric effect is evidence supporting the particle model of light. Statement 2, interference is evidence supporting the wave model of light. And statement 3, photons of sufficient energy can eject electrons from the surface of metals. Well, statement 1 is true because only particles can knock off other particles. Waves can't knock particles off the surface of anything. They would tend to just make them rise and fall. And therefore, part, the statement one, there's a photoelectric effect as evidence supporting a particle model of light is true. Statement two, interference is evidence supporting the wave model of light, yes, because only waves interfere. You have two waves coming together and the crest will meet the other crest to give you constructive interference, or in another situation, the crest might meet the trough to give you destructive interference. So interference is definitely uh, evidence supporting the wave model of light. So we've got two so far correct. The third statement, photons of sufficient energy can eject electrons from the surface of a metal. And that is true. Uh, photons can eject electrons from the surface of the metal, but those photons that can do that job must have a sufficient energy to do that, to overcome the work function of that particular metal. So photons of sufficient energy can eject electrons from the surface of the metal is true. We've got all three statements true, and that will lead us to 13, answer letter E. Question 14 from Paper 1 of the 2023 Higher Physics Examination from the SQA. 
a lot of reading this one, so we take our time. Electromagnetic radiation of frequency 9 times 10 to the power 14 hertz is incident on a clean, negatively charged metal surface. The work function of the metal is 6.1 times 10 to minus 19 joules. Now, there's no photoelectric emission from this metal caused by this radiation. And this is explained by the fact that, and we're given five possible explanations. Now, the hook for this question is to realise that the incoming energy of the photon must be greater than the work function, and that the incoming frequency of the photon must be greater than the threshold frequency in order for photo emission to take place. So let's go through the statements one at a time. Letter A says, or statement A says, photo emission can occur from a positively charged metal surface only. That's false. Photo emission can occur from a positively charged surface of a metal and a negatively charged surface of metal. It only depends on the incoming photon having sufficient energy to overcome the work function of that particular metal. So statement A will have to mark false. Statement B, the wavelength of the incident radiation is too short. Well, that's false as well, because we look at the energy of the photon equation, HF, and look at its sister equation, HC, divided by lambda, we can see that for short wavelengths, you're going to get big energies. So that's not going to explain why we don't get a photon emission from the met uh, electron emission from the metal because the photon energy could be big enough because if the radi if the radiation got a short wavelength it'll have a big enough energy to do that. So that's not a reason for it. There could be photo emission due to the short wavelength big energy photon. So that statement's false. Letter C or statement C says the frequency of the instant radiation is less than the threshold frequency of this metal. And we're told the threshold frequency, well, we're not told the threshold frequency, we're told the incoming photon's frequency. So we have to work out the threshold frequency. And to do that, we just got to rely on this equation here, the work function equals HF naught. If we rearrange, we get the work function is equal to, uh, sorry, we get the, the threshold frequency F naught is equal to the work function divided by Planck's constant. So we do that as a little sum we get the following. We get the threshold frequency for photo emission released from that metal is 6.1 times 10 minus 19 joules divided by Planck's constant, and we get a value for the threshold frequency to be 9.2 times 10 to the power 14 hertz. And that, in fact, is greater than the incoming photon's frequency. So we have to remind ourselves that the frequency of the photon is less than the threshold frequency. So... In this C here, it says the frequency of incident radiation is less than the threshold frequency of this metal. It's true, because we've just shown that to be the case by doing the calculation. So that's the, the true one so far. Let's satisfy ourselves by doing statement D and statement E. Statement D says the work function of the metal is less than the energy of the incident photons. Well, we've got the frequency of the photon. And we've got Planck's constant, and we can work out its energy and compare it with the work function. So to do that, we just simply take the energy of the photon and work it out. So we have this equation here, E equals HF, Planck's constant times the frequency of the incoming photon, and we get 5.97 times 10 to minus 17 joules. Now, compare that to the work function. The work function is 6.1 times 10 to minus 19 joules. So we can state the following. We can say that the work function of the metal is greater than the energy of the photon. So obviously statement D is going to be false. So we've got statement D being false there as well. So statement C is our winning one so far. Statement E, the number of photons per second incident on the surface of the metal is too low. We know that's a well-known fact that photo emission can occur even with the most faintest light incident on the surface. It's nothing to do with the, the radiance of the light, it's to do with the frequency of the light. That's the whole uh, aspect, important part of the photoelectric effect. The emission of photoelectrons depends on the threshold frequency or the frequency of the photon, not how much f uh, photons are arriving at the surface. So a very long question, a very a uh, difficult question, and we have to do two kind of calculations here, but our answer for 14 is statement C. That's the correct one. 
Question 15 from the 2023 Higher Physics Examination of the SQA, Paper 1. A ray of monochromatic light is incident on a grating, and interference pattern is observed on the screen. The angle between the central maximum and the maximum observed at the edge of the screen is 29 degrees. The wavelength of the light used is 605 nanometers, and the separation of the slits on the grating is, is 5.0 times 10 to minus 6 meters. And our job is to find the total number of maxima observed on the screen. So we start with our equation of the diffraction grating. It's going to be m is going to equal to d sine theta. m is the order of the maxima we're looking at. Lambda is the wavelength, d is the spacing between the lines in the grating, and sine theta is the angle to that maximum. So what we should do first of all is find what the order of the maximum is out here. What's that order we're looking at? Remember we've got the central maximum, and we've got the first, second, third, fourth, all the way up to wherever it is in. So we've got to find what m is, so we do m is going to equal to d sine theta. I'm going to divide that by the wavelength. So that's how we find the order in which is at the end of the screen. So put the numbers in. We get m equals d, and d becomes 5.0 times 10 to the minus 6 of a meter, multiplied by sine of 29, because we're looking at the angle up to the maximum, which will be 29 degrees from the central maximum. Put a bracket around that there, and divide by the wavelength and we'll have to change it into metres. So 605 nanometres becomes 605 times 10 to the minus 9 of a metre. Now when we do that, we calculate, we end up with a value of m equal to 4. So what we're really seeing in the screen is the following. We have got the central maximum. That's that one there. And remember, after the central maximum, the maxima are labelled the first maxima, second, whatever it is. So, according to our calculations, we have got four maxima after that. So, we have the central maximum, m equal to 1, m equal to 2, m equal to 3, and m equal to 4. But you have to be careful here, because we don't only get this maxima in here, we get the other four below the central maximum in this side. So we have the following pattern, like that. So it's a kind of trick question here, because even though we've found the maximum we're looking at, which is the fourth maximum, if you count up the number of maxima on the screen, including the central maximum, and including the four maximum below it, we get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So in fact, the answer is going to be D. It's going to be nine maxima we see on the screen. And that's a very tricky question now. So recap that again. Use your equation m lambda equals d sine theta. We work out m and m equals 4. And that will be the fourth maximum up here. But we've got to remember an important fact is that you've got a central maximum as well. So the central maximum, you count the maxima from that. First maxima, second, third and fourth. So the fourth one's at the end of the screen. But there will also be four below that. One, two, three, four, to give you a total maxima on the screen to be equal to nine. A very tricky question. Answer, 15D.